the UF Health Wellness University webinar. My name is Marsha Mott. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss nutrition and exercise during pregnancy. I'd like to introduce you to our speakers, Dr. Danielle Nelson and Dr. Michael Tudine. Both of our speakers are family medicine physicians who see patients at the UF Health Family Medicine Main Street location in Gainesville, Florida. This location offers care to women before, during, and after their pregnancy. If you have questions for our speakers today, you can submit written questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I'll read your question anonymously, and we will only be accepting written questions today. We're going to try to get through as many questions as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now, Dr. Nelson. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Marsha. Um, hi. So my name is Dr. Danielle Nelson. I'm a family medicine doctor. And um, I work at UF Health Main Street, just like uh, she just said, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about exercise and pregnancy today. Let's just start sharing. Okay. Um, so, we're gonna cover a few different topics about exercise and pregnancy. First, we're just gonna go over- Dr. Nelson, can you make it full screen for us? Oops. All right, let me just try again. There we go. Is that better? Okay. Yep, that looks perfect. Okay. Um, so we're just going to first do a brief overview of normal changes during pregnancy and how those relate to exercise. Um, we're also going to talk about the benefits and recommendations for exercise during pregnancy. There are some occasional harms of exercise during pregnancy, so we'll make sure we talk about those. And then finally, we're going to focus on return to exercise after pregnancy and the special considerations there. So first there's um, several different big categories of physiologic changes during pregnancy. We see changes in the cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, muscle and joints. And then also just in general, there is an increase in basal metabolic rate during pregnancy, about 15%, um, and an increase in core temperature. So first off to talk about the cardiovascular changes, a big one is that there's a dilation of peripheral vascular system. So that's what causes some people to feel lightheaded if they try to get up quickly or if they're bending down um, during pregnancy. Um, and it also lowers the blood pressure overall. And we'll, I'll show you a graph about how that happens. Um, also the heart rate increases and the blood volume increases during pregnancy just really trying to get more blood and oxygen and all those good nutrients um, to the fetus. So this is just a graph about um, how the cardiac output increases over time during pregnancy. You can see on the left in the pre-pregnancy um, and then kind of hits a maximum in the second trimester. Um, so the heart's really pumping the largest amount of blood around at that second trimester, and then it kind of stays stable through the third trimester and then decreases uh, in the postpartum period. Uh, similarly, the peripheral vascular resistance or the dilation that we talked about um, gets more and more until the second trimester, and then it kind of gradually comes back up. So the second trimester is also where you'll see the lowest blood pressures in people during their pregnancy. Um, so in terms of pulmonary changes, the biggest and most obvious one, even to people who aren't doctors, is that there's a baby there, which is putting a lot of pressure on the intestines, the organs, but also pushing up that diaphragm, um, just in terms of the physical space that the lungs have is less. Um, and then there's also an increased oxygen demand um, and that's partly just to provide enough oxygen to the fetus because of the increased um, basal metabolic rate and the increased blood volume. Um, there's increased oxygen demand. And then also there's an increased amount of air breathed per minute or minute ventilation. So that's 
partly just trying to get the same amount um, in a smaller space so so there's um, more air per minute partially the rate that people are breathing and also just the volume so in terms of musculoskeletal changes um, this is, again, you don't need a medical degree to know that during pregnancy, there's an increase in the lumbosacral curve um, or the low back curve. Um, there's also a change in the center of gravity. You've got a, a baby growing in the, in the midsection. Um, and then due to hormonal changes, women do have joint laxity and increased mobility of their joints which can cause um, injuries if you're not careful. And then finally, as the uterus gets larger and the fetus gets larger, um, you will see stretching of the round ligaments, which are um, basically the ligaments that hold up the uterus. So that kind of brings us to very common complaints during pregnancy. Um, these are related to those changes that we talked about. So. Uh, very large, very common complaint for many pregnant women is low back pain. And that can come from several different specific diagnoses, um, sacroiliac or the pelvic joint um, pain can from irritation of those joints or what's called sciatica or sciatic nerve irritation, uh, which can cause shooting pain down the legs starting from the low back. And then hand and wrist complaints. Um, it's very common to see women during their pregnancy to have carpal tunnel syndrome um, with tingling and nerve pain in their fingers and hands. Um, and then also decor veins is a type of wrist overuse injury um, or tendonitis. And this is pretty common in pregnancy and also in the postpartum period, partially because uh, the woman is now lifting a baby uh, many times a day, and that can be irritating to the wrist as well. And then finally, round ligament pain that generally starts in the second trimester. And again, that's the stretching of the ligaments that are holding up the uterus. And that can cause sharp pain, especially if you're doing more motion movement in, in the day. So I just want to go into common myths and facts about exercise in pregnancy. And I also throughout the talk gonna highlight different pregnant athletes, um, some famous, some not so famous. Um, so on the left here, we have um, Allison Felix. She's a track and field star in the 100, 200, and 400 meters. Um, she famously had a contract dispute with Nike due to her pregnancy and their contracts and policies that they had in place prior to her activism um, in, that were really detrimental to women who wanted to have pregnancies and still continue to compete. So she ended up actually moving to Athleta um, and is now sponsored by Athleta and no longer by Nike. Um, and then on the right, I think most people recognize Serena Williams. So she famously continued to train during her pregnancy and then competed obviously is still competing at a, a very high level um, after her pregnancy. So I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about contraindications to exercise. There are a few, um, and these are all what we consider abnormal pregnancies. So if you do have any of these conditions, then you definitely should talk to your doctor, but generally um, is these are conditions which you would need special guidance in order to continue or um, start an exercise program. So specifically heart disease, restrictive lung disease. If you have an incompetent cervix, which is where the cervix dilates uh, early or prematurely, or if you have a cerclage, which is where you might sew that cervix shut so that you can continue the pregnancy. Um, if you have multiple gestation and you're at risk for premature labor, if you have persistent bleeding in the second and third trimester, if you have previa or that's a placenta that's too low after 26 weeks, if you're having premature labor in this pregnancy, so not a previous pregnancy, but this one, 
um, or if you have preeclampsia or pregnancy induced hypertension, and if you have severe anemia. So definitely speak with your doctor before engaging in any sort of exercise if you have these types of abnormal pregnancies. So then I wanted to go over some myths um, and to kick us off in this discussion, we do have a poll. So Marsha's gonna send you some poll questions and you can vote on those. I didn't realize it was going to launch both questions, so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the, the second one I, seems like Dr. Tineen will probably cover, um, but we'll definitely talk about the first one, but please answer both questions. Okay, so it looks like 62% um, of you agree that exercise during pregnancy will not make you feel tired. Um, and I think, I don't know, Marsha, if you can pull these up again when we come for the second question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close. I think I can, yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So that's a common myth that, um, number one, that you, you can't start exercising during pregnancy if you didn't before. That's actually a relatively new um discussion that some doctors, previous recommendations for the, the professional society said that you can continue exercising if you've been doing it, but don't start anything new. Um, that's modified and, and we'll talk about the specific guidelines from the professional societies. Um, but that is, that is a myth that you can't start exercising during pregnancy. Um, but then another common one, which is the question that we asked, is that exercise will make you feel more exhausted. And, you know, during pregnancy, it is common to feel fatigued and tired. Your body's doing a lot of work. Um, but the studies have really panned out that just like in non-pregnant people exercising, although, you know, it can hard, be hard to overcome that inertia and get started with it. Once you get started, it actually can make you feel um, better. Um, and less exhausted. Um, so it's also a common myth that you can't run during your pregnancy. And I'll show you some pictures of, of people who've really um, thrown that one on their head. Uh, another myth, you can't exercise your abs during pregnancy with the caveat of large diastasis recti. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, what that is and whether or not you should do certain exercises if you have it. And then another myth, you can't do weight training during pregnancy. So um, this is just a picture of a belly band. I'm not promoting any particular brand or style, but this is an example of something that you can use um, if exercise makes you feel uncomfortable, specifically um, running. Not everybody can continue running during their pregnancy. They might feel uncomfortable, but there's no specific contraindication to running. So if you feel comfortable running, if you're using a, a appropriate support and you feel fine, then there is no reason why you can't run. And then this is a picture of Alyssa Montano, who's a, in 2014 famously ran the 800 meters um, when she was eight months pregnant. Uh, she's also an Olympic track and field star. So, and then finally back to the, you can't do weight training during pregnancy. There was previously a concern that, um, that the bearing down or the Valsalva maneuver of doing severe heavy weights could cause fetal problems. However, that hasn't panned out um, in studies of women who are doing moderate exercise and weight training. So there are some facts. It's important to stay hydrated, uh, harder and more important during pregnancy uh, than when you're not pregnant. Uh, you really wanna make sure that you don't get overheated. Uh, the, it's easier to become overheated during your pregnancy. That's partly because that increased basal metabolic rate and it can be detrimental to the fetus if you raise your core body temperature over 102 degrees. 
So in July in Gainesville, you might want to exercise in a pool or in an air conditioned space. Don't lie flat on your back after 20 weeks. Maintain calories. And I know Dr. Tidane will talk about this. There is a risk of hypoglycemia and potentially weight loss if you're not maintaining your calories during pregnancy. And you shouldn't exercise after you've ruptured your membranes or broke your bag of water. And if contractions do persist after stopping exercise, or if you have significant vaginal bleeding during exercise, those are reasons to get evaluated, talk to your doctor. Um, but other than that, there's a few more facts and, and risks. You do wanna avoid risk of abdominal injuries. So this is something that's led a lot of doctors in the past to say, you can't do certain things because they might cause abdominal injuries. You should avoid contact sports for that reason. Um, but as you can see, Beth Roden here is a famous rock climber in Yosemite uh, who was rock climbing during her pregnancy. She knew what she was doing. She was safe. Although this is considered an extreme sport, uh, she wasn't at an increased risk of abdominal injuries. And so she made the decision to continue climbing. There is a, a hard and fast, which is no scuba diving. And that's because the... Um, the bubbles can't be filtrated by the fetal lung system. And so it can cause, um, it can be very dangerous to the fetus. So scuba diving is the one sport that uh, everyone agrees you shouldn't do during pregnancy. So then there's some other kind of question marks. Uh, in the past, a lot of doctors have said no biking, no skiing. Uh, because of the risk of abdominal injuries. You can see my bias. This is actually a picture of me uh, two or three days before my daughter was born. Uh, so you can see I felt comfortable biking because I had continued doing it throughout my pregnancy. Obviously, if someone's uncomfortable on a bike or is at risk of high risk of falls, it's probably not a good choice. Hot yoga probably out. That's a gray zone. Again, you don't want to get overheated during your pregnancy and it can be risk because of that increase of muscle and joint laxity that can be riskier in the, in the hot yoga. So you want to be careful with that. And we don't really know how much is too much. So as you'll see, when we get to the professional society recommendations, generally recommendations are for maintaining or doing moderate exercise, but nobody is recommending training or increasing uh, to a high level or an elite level. So again, coming back to risk of abdominal injuries in the past, there's sort of this no skiing. As you can see, uh, this woman, Caroline George is a famous or a professional mountaineering guide in Switzerland. She feels very comfortable on skis and she continued skiing throughout her pregnancy. But Florida man over here probably shouldn't be uh, skiing during pregnancy. So there are lots of benefits of exercise during pregnancy. The biggest one um, being that it can increase the chance of having a successful vaginal delivery. I think most people agree that in the absence of other reasons, this is generally the goal that people can, can recover faster from vaginal deliveries than they can from C-sections. And in general, all the things that exercise decreases are the things that we're trying to avoid, excessive weight gain, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension or high blood pressure disorders, preterm birth, cesarean, depression, just like exercise at all times of life can decrease depression and also decrease overall pain. So that brings us to our professional society recommendation. So ACOG is the American College of Obstetrics, Obstetrician and Gynecologists, and they did an update just in March of 2020 and now they say that physical activity and exercise in pregnancy are associated with minimal risks and have been shown to benefit most women. 
Although some modification exercise routines may be necessary because of normal anatomic and physiologic changes and fetal requirements. So that comes back to most women because there are some high risk pregnancies where you should avoid exercise, but those are few. And then also modification, like we talked about, not lying flat on your back after 20 weeks and things like that. In the absence of obstetric or medical complications or contraindications, physical activity in pregnancy is safe and desirable, and pregnant women should be encouraged to continue or to initiate safe physical activities. So again, this is relatively new that they are recommending that it's okay to initiate exercise. So many prenatal care providers are still using the old recommendation of continuing what you're already doing, but not starting anything new. And so I just wanna make sure that I emphasize that it is okay if you're thinking this is be a great time to um, improve your lifestyle and you haven't been physically active, it's okay to initiate gradually after discussing with, with your doctor. So the Canadian Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists have much more specific recommendations. So I wanted to highlight those just because they really go through what the evidence is for each of these. So again, there's nothing that they disagree on. It's just much more specific recommendations. So all women without contraindications should be encouraged to participate in aerobic and strength strength conditioning exercises. Reasonable goals of aerobic conditioning in pregnancy should be to maintain a good fitness level without trying to reach peak fitness or train for an athletic competition. Women should choose activities that will minimize the risk of loss of balance and fetal trauma. So we still agree that it's bad to have abdominal injuries, but again, each person has to evaluate their own risk Women should be advised that adverse pregnancy or neonatal outcomes are not increased for exercising women. This is an old myth. And beyond what ACOG has mentioned, they really emphasize that initiation of pelvic floor exercises in the immediate postpartum period can reduce risk of future urinary incontinence, which is common in women who have uh, been pregnant in their lifetime. So that brings me to returning to exercise after a vaginal delivery. So again, just like the Canadian Society recommended, uh, pelvic floor exercises are a good idea to start right away. And these are things like Kegel exercises, um, but can also be biofeedback or pelvic physical therapy. I've been told that in France, uh, this is guaranteed to all women to start pelvic physical therapy uh, immediately in the postpartum period. Check for continence before you do any high impact exercises or running. And, but low impact exercises can be within a few days whenever you feel ready. And then you can gradually work up to higher impact exercises. Over on the right, again, I don't have any financial interest or support from any brands, but this is a product called Mama Strut, which includes belly support, perineal support, and even um, does ice packs of the perineum that can be helpful in the postpartum period. You probably should hold off on crunches if you have diastasis until that heals up, and I'll show you what that is in a few minutes. And then swimming, you should wait about six weeks or until your lochia or your bleeding has stopped. So again, another myth alert, Moderate exercise when you're breastfeeding does not affect breast milk or impact infant growth. So it's safe to do. And then similarly, after a cesarean, pelvic floor exercises right away, check for continence before doing any high impact exercises or running. Again, you're waiting for the diastasis to heal, but also for the incision to heal before doing any crunch type abdominal exercises. And then you gradually work up to higher impact exercise and you should be 
for swimming again about six weeks and you should be cleared by your surgeon that they've taken a look at the incision and made sure that it's healed well so pelvic floor exercises what to do kegel exercises are the ones that most people have heard of before but a lot of people don't really know how to do kegel exercises or to engage the pelvic floor so that's where biofeedback comes in so pelvic physical therapists are trained professionals which can help you and provide biofeedback to strengthen your pelvic floor after childbirth however there are also some home uh, products out there uh, again, no financial relationships, and I'm not uh, sponsored by them, but there's two that are out there, are PeriFit and LV. They're both um, biofeedback home products where they go in the vagina and then send a Bluetooth message to a phone and you, it gives you biofeedback in terms of whether you're engaging those pelvic floor muscles. But the cheap and easy way of doing it is to, you know you're engaging your Kegel muscles or your pelvic floor muscles if you can stop the flow of urine when you're urinating. So then diastasis or diastasis recti is a separation of the muscles of the abdominal wall. So you can see in the picture at the bottom, there's several different types. There's where it separates around the belly button, separates below the belly button, separates above the belly button, or kind of open all around um, or all along. And you can tell if you have this, if you kind of do a crunch type motion and you can fit your fingers in between the muscles that engage or like the, the six pack muscles. Um, it's very, very common during and after pregnancy, about 50% of women have some degree of this. And the ones that we really have to be careful for is the large ones where there's three or more finger breaths. And so those you should really talk to your doctor about what to do and how to improve that and heal that. But for the most part, most people have small separations and those can be improved with strengthening the deep transverse, transverse abdominus muscles. And if you talk to your doctor about it, physical therapists um, are very good at at helping you engage those transverse abdominus muscles. Um, but there's also lots of exercises online that you can do. Most of them involve kind of pushing your abdominal muscles or your navel towards the floor if you're lying on your back with your knees bent um, or doing kind of side uh, plank type exercises. So again, um, some more recent pregnant athletes. Um, so Alephine Tuliamuk was, um, is probably the first, last, and only athlete to be able to qualify and win the marathon Olympic trials last year in January, 2020, and then subsequently uh, conceive, have a pregnancy and deliver a baby in January, 2021 before participating in the same Olympics that she qualified for. So since Tokyo was postponed, she should be competing in the Olympic marathon uh, when Tokyo, the Tokyo Olympics occur. And then Alex Morgan, US soccer player, um, she had her baby uh, May, 2020. She had been planning on kind of returning to play in time for Tokyo last summer, but then it didn't happen. So she should be competing in the upcoming Tokyo as well. And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, you can turn your screen share off and yes. then we'll get on Dr. Tooting up here. All right, we'll wait a second for him to come in here. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and submit those questions anytime. Um, Dr. Tudin, you wanna turn off your, uh, turn on your microphone and then start your screen share. We'll be all good to go.
Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. It looks great. Okay. Hey, everyone. My name is Michael Tudin. I'm also a family medicine physician here at UF Health Main Street Clinic, along with Dr. Nelson. Um, uh, she talked a lot about uh, uh, exercise during pregnancy. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about healthy eating in pregnancy. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview, I'm going to talk to you about uh, basics of staying healthy um, as far as your diet's concerned, uh, my plate recommendations based on U.S. Uh, research and governmental recommendations, uh, the different like high demand foods that you oftentimes hear about in pregnancy and what nutrients we need to make sure that we get, um, foods that we should be aware of that could potentially have um, unintended or dangerous side effects. And so just to be aware of those, um, to avoid them or to make sure you, you get less of them. Uh, appropriate weight gain in pregnancy, as well as uh, managing some of the symptoms that oftentimes happen in pregnancy related to food, um, like nausea, vomiting, those kind of things. Um, and then spe special considerations related to like vegetarian, vegan, or other restrictive diets. So, uh, you know, in, in pregnancy overall, the most important thing is that you continue to strive to be healthy. Um, when you're living your best life, uh, you know, overall, these should be your general goals, but it does feel a little bit more intense when you all of a sudden are pregnant and you're worried about um, your, your mother-in-law or possibly someone else in your life talking about baby development. And it, also, uh, it sort of feels a little bit more uh, high risk or high stakes. But, you know, I, I think the most important thing is to always take care of your body and to eat appropriately. And so, you know, generally these are, are things that we hear about all the time in the, um, in the news media. So eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains, uh, various kinds of protein sources, not just meats, but also beans, lentils, and then uh, dairy products, trying to go more towards on the low fat side of those. Uh, I brought up Michael Pollan's book here, not because it's uh, a book that I think that everyone needs to go read, but it is something that's sort of a catchy phrase that if you can remember these three things, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, if you're able to follow those three idioms, you're gonna be setting yourself up for success. Um, the next thing I put in there is, it's very common people will talk about eating for two and all the different cravings that go along with pregnancy, but really trying to moderate that because even though as Dr. Nelson was saying in pregnancy, you do have increased caloric demands. Most of those actually happen in the second and third trimesters and they're not as much as you might think. Um, and then also try, you know, the U.S. diet is um, inherently full of all kinds of uh, processed foods that have a lot of extra sugar and salt in them. It's trying to avoid some of those, uh, shopping more on the periphery of the grocery aisle rather than in the, um, in the different aisles. Uh, so I'm not going to get into all the little details here, but there is a website called myplate.gov that um, breaks down the U.S. recommended uh, diet, and this is um, a recommendation for average, uh, I think, 5'5 five, five, uh, woman uh, who weighs like 130 or 140 at the beginning of pregnancy, um, and this is like what their general recommendation is for the, um, their first uh, trimester of pregnancy. And so you can see a few, a uh, couple cups of, uh, of fruit a day, uh, two and a half cups of vegetables, six ounces, which is like weight, uh, weight ounces, not fluid ounces, six ounces of grains, five and a half ounces of protein, and then three cups of, of milk. A lot of people don't think about this that way. And so it does take a little bit of adjusting to, but um, I, I highlight this because you know, this is something that is the general recommended thing for all people out there, but then it does, specifically in the grains, proteins, vegetables, there is an increase uh, during pregnancy. And so you want to slightly increase the amount of vegetables, whole grains and proteins that you have throughout pregnancy. Um, and that goes along with increased caloric need about uh, 300 to 450 calories a day, which is about like a half a, a half a sandwich or so more a day. So, you know, without getting into too much details about all the different required things, some of the big take homes that the US government and all these different researchers have found is that our diet in the US has way too much refined products, way too much sugar, saturated fats, and sodium specifically, and that we aren't having nearly enough vegetables or fruit. 
Um, also, the, the proteins that we're eating are generally high in, um, in, in fat, and we're not doing um, like lean meats, uh, or, and we're not getting nearly enough seafood that they would generally recommend. And so, you know, those are just general recommendations for your diet. Um, and there are lots of different ways that, you know, if you were to come see me in the clinic that we were able to sort of find a specific kind of regimen or, or sort of try to adjust our diet in certain ways to, to meet those recommendations. Um, I think it's a little beyond the scope of this um, talk, but that's just to set a little baseline expectation. Um, you know, but then talking about pregnancy specifically, I already talked about how some of those demands go up and then we're like, well, why, why are we having this talk? Why is it so important that uh, diet and pregnancy is, is something that we would talk about today that y'all would come here for today? And I would just say that there's two big things. One is that there are increased in um, some high demand nutrients. And then two, there are some increased risks that the general population doesn't have. But when you're pregnant, you have increased risk for both you and baby. And we want to make sure that you're, you're aware of those. Uh, so talking about those high demand foods uh, or high demand nutrients, um, iron is one of the big ones. You need iron in your body in order to make more blood, which is something that your blood expands uh, from like four liters to about like six liters during pregnancy. And in order to make all of that blood to, be, to get oxygen and other nutrients to baby, uh, you have to have a lot of iron. And so iron stores, we know, go down in pregnancy and thus you need to get a lot more of it in your diet. And so, you know, there, there are what we call heme iron, non-heme iron, um, and the heme iron is from, uh, from animal sources versus non-heme iron is from um, the plant sources. And we know that the, the, the animal sources actually get absorbed a little bit better in our diet. And so, you know, you can get those definitely from your, from your meats, your poultry, your seafood, but then you can also get from um, non, non-animal products as well. But it's important to realize that those don't get absorbed quite as well. And uh, so you'll be checking, you know, when you go to your doctor, you'll be getting your blood counts checked throughout pregnancy and they'll be advising you, do you need extra, extra iron than even what you're gaining in your diet or do you need to, um, uh, or are you good? And um, a prenatal vitamin may be, uh, prenatal vitamins generally are recommended, but one that has a little bit more iron or, or a separate iron supplement altogether may be recommended. Uh, there are a few other things that are, uh, tricks of the trade. So like cast iron, uh, cooking with cast iron um, pots or pans can get a little more iron in, in your diet, as well as there's this product uh, called the, the Lucky Iron Fish, which you can cook with stews um, or soups that you put one of those in while you're cooking and it gets some more iron into your diet. Uh, I have no, nothing to disclose. I have no um, uh, associations with that company, but it's just something that I regularly recommend to patients. And then uh, the other thing would be uh, folic acid. You all probably hear about this. Uh, one of the things that I would just highlight is that before you ever even get pregnant, we really want to try to build up your folic acid or folate stores. Uh, and so, you know, there are a lot of ways to do that. I listed a few different fruit, foods in there that are high in folic acid. Um, other things you can do is you can take a prenatal vitamin. A lot of people start doing that before they ever consider getting pregnant because we really want to build up those stores like a month or two before you ever get pregnant. So if you're out there trying to get pregnant right now, uh, I recommend trying to really put a big emphasis on those foods I mentioned below um, and, and or uh, starting on a prenatal vitamin because when what you're trying to target with folic acid is the closure of the neural tube. And so you don't develop a condition or your baby doesn't develop a condition called um, spina bifida. And although it's not fully prevented by getting enough folic acid, it's reduced by 50, 60% by getting enough folic acid. And so um, that's something that we would highly recommend. And of note that the, um, the neural tube defect would happen in the first month or two of pregnancy. And that's oftentimes before people ever come see their doctor um, or before they even know they're officially pregnant. And so it is important to start that as soon as possible. Uh, other big high demand foods that help with brain development specifically, iodine is one of them. Most people in the United States have enough iodine. We have iodine in um, most of our, our like table salt 
products. And so if you get regular iodine or re regular iodized salts you, um, in your grocery store, you probably have enough as well if you, as well as if you eat various meat products um, or dairy products, you'll have iodine in it. Um, but if for some reason you don't normally do that, I would make sure you go out and get iodized table salt uh, and that should be, that should be fine. Uh, the other thing is choline. You hear more and more about that. That typically is also found in various dairy and meat products, um, uh, as well as seafood products. And then a few other uh, beans, peas, lentils in, in that protein group can also be very helpful. And that's all that all is um, some of the things that make up the, the white matter in the brain and help babies brain development. So it's important to get both of those. So, you know, you, I, th I think that the messaging that a lot of pregnant women get, uh, unfortunately, from whether it be um, you know friends or family members who are well intentioned, um, or even the media, is a, a little bit more of scare scare tactics or um, I don't know guilt trips. And I just want to try to relieve everyone of those things. And just you know, I tried to be very particular where I wrote this out here: foods to be aware of. Um, there, you're going to hear a lot of different things from a lot of different people, and it's important that you have important conversations like this with your uh, physician when, whenever you or, or midwife um, or whoever your prenatal care provider is. But um, there, there are a lot of things that you'll hear that may that people will just say, "Oh, you you should not eat that. You should not touch that. You should not be anywhere close to that." And um, there are some of those things that I definitely would would agree with in some degree, but also I don't want to make any mom out there feel like they're being a terrible parent by eating certain uh, food products out there that, um, you know, potentially could put them at risk, but, but also um, realizing that there's a lot of cultural differences um, between these recommendations. And so there, there are a lot of different things go into this. And so before I get too much into it, I just wanted to put that disclaimer out there. Um, so foods to be aware of fish and seafood. It wasn't too long ago that actually the, um, the U.S. was recommending against fish in pregnancy because of concerns about mercury specifically. Uh, we walked that back in the, um, the, I think it was around like 2012 or 2013, something like that. And now we actually highly recommend fish. It's really, there's only a few fish out there that have a lot of mercury. And if you look at the infographic over there, it's that orange group, which are largely these, these really big fish like sharks, uh, swordfish, tilefish, those are the ones that you want to avoid. And then the other ones have varying amounts of possibilities of having mercury. Um, the, there's what, what's considered the best choice by this graphic put out by the FDA. And that one, they recommend two to three servings, uh, which a serving being about the size of the palm of your hand. Um, that, so two to three servings a week of those fish, um, as well as, um, and then there's other one who might have, maybe has a slightly higher chance of having mercury in it. And that one they recommend limiting to like one serving a week. And that would be like grouper, my, my, um, but you know, a lot of, a lot of your, um, seafood. So not just, not just fish, but seafood are in that best choices. So like the shrimp and the clams, uh, oysters, those things are all really great for you. Um, and have, uh, really high, uh, amounts of protein and, all the D and also DHA, which is great for baby's development as well. Um, one thing of note, and this is unique in, in various different cultures, there are certain cultures out there that uh, they eat lots of fresh fish and lots of raw fish, uh, whether they are pregnant or not pregnant, and that generally doesn't stop when in their pregnancy. Uh, here in the US, we recommend against um, having sushi or sashimi or uh, raw fish in pregnancy. And that's because there is a uh, 12 times increased risk of uh, non-pregnant versus pregnant women of getting listeria. There are actually many different foods out there that could potentially expose you to listeria, but just sushi and sashimi, I, I feel like are some of the, the ones that get highlighted a lot. And so it's just to, to be aware um, um, of note, all sushi, whether it says it's frozen or not, uh, probably gets flash frozen at some point in its in its um, uh, site and, and it's like product um, shipping cycle. And so, large majority of it has gotten its bacteria killed initially. But then, you know, based on the handling after that and the fact that it doesn't get heated up right before it gets served to you, there's always a chance that you could have a bacteria that you're as a pregnant woman more susceptible to. And so just being aware of that and knowing that you are at a slightly increased risk of listeria. Listeria in pregnancy develops in the setting of, uh, or it feels that are like flu-like symptoms. It usually happens 
uh, a few days to all the way up to a month after you get pregnant or after, after you get exposed. And so it's not something that uh, always is apparent right away, like food poisoning or something like that, but it's something to keep in mind and to have an open conversation with your prenatal provider about in case uh, you have been eating sushi or something else that has potential exposure to listeria so they could do appropriate uh, testing and counseling. Uh, I, yeah, I, this, these both go along with that same listeria thing. Um, so soft, unpasteurized cheeses. And so um, in the U.S., it's actually illegal to, uh, for commercial interstate um, selling of unpasteurized uh, products. And so mostly what we're talking about is like, you know, um, uh, people at like, uh, local farmers markets selling unpasteurized products or something like that. Um, but if you're buying stuff from like Publix or um, other major food markets, chances are they've been they've been crossing state lines, and so these are highly re re regulated um, uh, products that have been pasteurized and and or have been aged for greater than sixty days. And so the risk of listeria is very very low with that. And so cheese, by and large, is a safe product unless again you're buying from someone who's not a big commercial seller, someone who maybe works at a local farm market or um, uh, is selling um, like non-commercial grade cheese. Um, meats, on the other hand, you know, we oftentimes have pre-cooked deli meats or hot dogs that um, are normally okay for your average person to eat, but in pregnancy, again, you have a higher risk of um, of listeria. And so if you are going to eat these things, make sure you cook them again, all the way up to, to boiling or very hot. Um, and then you, if you're going to have like a steak or some other food that sometimes you might eat as like a rare or medium rare, the, the recommended um, thing in pregnancy, again, is to avoid listeria exposure, uh, is to fully cook all of your meats. And uh, to sort of continue on with this discussion, uh, there is no amount of alcohol uh, that has been studied that um, is, is completely safe. So, you know, some people will, will drink one or two drinks a week and feel totally comfortable. The, there's been some studies I've shown with one or two, with I think moderate alcohol consumption, which is defined as two drinks a week, there was a 10% increased risk of preterm delivery. And so uh, we don't have like a safe level or a safe frequency of alcohol consumption. And generally speaking, we recommend that as soon as you find out you're pregnant or as soon as you're really trying to get pregnant, trying to um, significantly cut back or stop uh, alcohol drinking to reduce your, your risk of, um, of problems as well as problems for your baby in the pregnancy. Uh, and then caffeine is something that oftentimes gets, gets asked about. Uh, generally speaking, low to moderate consumption of caffeine is considered fine, which is like less than 200 uh, milligrams or micrograms a day depending on what kind of coffee you get. If you get a Starbucks, um, uh, like strong coffee, then it might be one cup versus if you get something that's decaf, it might be several, several cups. Um, but it's important that you, uh, you don't go overboard and stay in a moderate amount. Um, and we do know that caffeine does cross the, um, the placental barrier. Um, and so it is something that could affect baby and potentially um, cause things like preterm birth and, and, and such. So another big question that we have in pregnancy is how much weight should you gain? I think actually um, we asked this question uh, earlier. I'm not sure if you could pull it up still or not. I think, yeah. Um, so we had that, um, how much How much should the average woman gain during, um, during pregnancy? We had eight people say 15 to 25 pounds, and then five people say 25 to 35 pounds. And then, um, you know, and then there's a few other things that people didn't choose. And so it, it, there, you will see actually between countries, this does vary a little bit, but here in the US, it's recommended between 25 and 35 pounds. Um, of course, this does depend on your BMI. And so if you're overweight or obese, that would go, uh, that would go significantly less. And if you're underweight, that could go more. Um, but it's important that you have that conversation with your doctor, especially in your first prenatal visit to see where you're at currently. And um, it's not uncommon at all in the first trimester that as you're often experiencing nausea, vomiting, those kinds of symptoms, you might stay even, or you actually might lose weight. Um, and again, your caloric needs don't actually increase in your first trimester. So it's important that even if someone's been telling you, oh, <laughs> wait one second. Sorry about that. My lights went out. Uh, I guess I wasn't moving enough. 
Um, uh, even though in the first trimester, people might say, oh, you need to um, eat way differently um, or you need to eat way more. That's not necessarily the case in the sense of calories. Um, uh, and so making sure that you're not trying to eat uh, extremely excessively in the first trimester, which is the first 13 weeks of your pregnancy, um, and instead waiting um, to increase those caloric demands in the second and third trimester, and so that you gain most of your weight actually in the last several months of pregnancy. Um, and I think I already talked about, you know, 300 to 450 calories, which is about a, a full glass of milk or a half a sandwich. So um, acid reflux, nausea, vomiting, oh my. Uh, these are things that oftentimes happen in the first trimester, the first 13 weeks of pregnancy. Um, there are a bunch of different things that you can try, whether it be small meals throughout the day, whether it be ginger, ginger ale, um, various teas, those can make it feel better. Um, trying not to get overly stuffed and also not allow yourself to, to be incredibly hungry can also help. Um, laying down can make acid reflux significantly worse and it can also make nausea and vomiting worse. So, you know, if, if you are feeling really bad, try to get in a comfortable position, but don't spend all your time laying down. Um, there are a few over-the-counter products as well, B6, um, Imitrol, uh, Doxalamine, or Unisom. These are all things that you could talk with your primary care doctor about, um, uh, but are available over the counter. And then if none of those work and you are losing significant weight uh, and you're not able to stay hydrated, uh, it could be a very significant thing that you even might need to go to the emergency department with for, and I'd recommend calling your, um, your prenatal provider about if that's a significant thing. I usually talk about this in the first trimester, but this actually can keep going on throughout pregnancy, um, but for most people, it's a short-lived uh, early pregnancy sign. So um, if you are a vegetarian or vegan, there are a few extra caveats to all of this. Um, again, if you're a vegetarian or vegan and you have, you've been one for a long time and you know you have a very good balanced diet, then overall that is not going to be at all harmful for the pregnancy. Um, you know, there, there might be some things that you need to supplement. I talked earlier a little about the iron, the heme versus non-heme. And so if you are iron deficient, um, uh, then you might need to get on an iron supplement a little bit earlier. Um, or talk about a few different ways to strategize how you can get more iron in your diet. Uh, B12 is only through uh, animal products. And so that's something that you might end up needing to get through like a, a vitamin supplement. Um, calcium and vitamin D, if you're, if you're someone who doesn't have a lot of dairy products, again, that might be something you get either through fortified uh, cereals or, um, or supplementation. And so, you know, these are just a few last element things. Um, a lot of people talk to me, gosh, I, I really love desserts. I love desserts too. Um, and I'm not saying that you absolutely can't do that. The general recommendation is to keep less than 10% of your calories. So if you're going based on a 2000 calorie diet, less than 200 calories a day, due to like desserts or, or like really increase, um, you know, oils or sugars. And so, Instead of having something like a Snickers bar or ice cream for dessert every single time, maybe trying to have fruit or a low fat yogurt um, for desserts, trying to get that, that um, sweet tooth um, fed. Um, oftentimes people are chronically low. They usually only have like one serving uh, um, or one cup of vegetables a day. And so trying to add vegetables into sauces or soups. So cutting up carrots or, or um, dicing uh, carrots or shredding them, uh, onion, celery, those kind of things can really add up over time. Um, if you don't tolerate dairy, but you're really needing all the benefits of that, there's a lot of soy and almond alternatives to it. Um, even though fruit juices, veggie juices um, do technically count um, towards those groups, I would say by and large, try to drink mostly water. Um, most people in the United States uh, will overeat the amount of calories that we need uh, during pregnancy. And so, you know, rather than filling up with a bunch of sugars uh, and, and juices, um, try, to, try to focus mostly on water. And, you know, if you are, are doing good with everything else and you want an occasional juice in your know, that's good. But I just wouldn't go out and start and start chugging orange juice, which again has a lot of sugar in it. Um, uh, and then 
another big thing that I talk to people regularly about is uh, trying to do all of this while also being cost conscious. Um, it, it can be very difficult. It, it's always easier said than done to go grocery shopping and to get a well-balanced diet that doesn't have well or uh, highly processed foods. But I would just say that um, you know, if you can go there, go to your um, grocery store, try to buy in bulk for the, some of the things that keep well, whether it be beans, lentils, um, uh, or rice, or um, uh, or other grains. Um, trying to get frozen vegetables um, so that they they last for a long time and maybe are a little bit cheaper than some of the fresh ones. Look for in-season produce so that you can maximize taste as well as uh, get cheaper costs and some good deals on them. Um, those are all good options to be able to um, do this in a healthy way, but also be cost conscious. And so these are just three main resources, uh, dietaryguidelines.gov. Uh, they just came out with recent recommendations for the dietary guidelines for Americans for 2020 to 2025. Um, they informed a lot of the research for the myplate.gov website that I referenced a few times. And then also ACOG, as Daniel, rec or Daniel Nelson recommended earlier, they're a great resource for information as well. So thank you all so much. All right, thank you so much for uh, that presentation. And um, so we have several great questions that came in. And if you wanna stop your screen share, um, let's see. One of the questions is, is whole milk better for mom and baby than non-whole milk? And is organic safer than non-organic? Oh, we don't hear you, Dr. Tudine. Um, so, now <laughs> so in general, um, so when you talk about for baby, that, that gets a little bit different of a setting, um, you know, generally speaking for, for babies, we don't recommend, um, whole milk until one year old. And then it depends. You can talk with your, your baby's provider at that time about, you know, based on their weight and how they're growing, whether they need whole milk or 2% or whatnot. Um, but usually that's something that is not recommended in the first year of life. Um, for moms, you usually we, or for pregnant women, we usually also recommend, um, uh, low, low fat, uh, um, options, you know, it, uh, that said, I mean, if you are underweight, um, and that's something that, you know, is based on your, your weight plus your height, your, what we call a BMI, uh, if you are underweight there, we might recommend increasing your calories, uh, throughout pregnancy. Okay. Um, and Dr. Nelson, you, you talked about this in, in your presentation. The question is, what would you consider severe anemia in the case where you talked about um, exercising, and then they go on to say HGB or HTC at what level? Great. Yeah, I saw that question. So um, usually I would consider that a level of a hemoglobin less than seven or someone that would require a transfusion if they would agree to it. Um, so for women who are not having transfusions, but their hemoglobin is less than seven, they should be cautious with ex exercising. Thank you. Okay, and then there's another question. Um, is sweating a problem in the third trimester? Is there anything special about uh, women who are pregnant sweating the last trimester? Uh, good question. I think in general, sweating is a response to overheating. So you need to make sure that you're not overheating, that you're not getting dehydrated. There's nothing particular to the third trimester in that regard. You might sweat more easily during pregnancy because your body is naturally trying to cool itself down and maintain a nice temperature, but uh, no danger in particular with sweating during your third trimester. Okay. Um, and are there any tips on dealing with uh, a backache at night while you sleep? If I had a... <laughs> If I had a dollar for everyone who asked me that question, or if I had a magic solution, that would be great. Uh, I think some women find that sleeping with lots of pillows can be helpful, sleeping on your side, sleeping with a pillow between your knees or a body pillow behind or in front of or both um, can be helpful for back pain. And then some people find that good habits and ergonomics and holding your posture, holding yourself throughout the day can prevent the back pain at night. 
and or icing or heat before you go to bed. I always kind of thought that those pains and the getting up and tossing and turning at night were preparing you. They're getting you slowly ready to, for a baby to get up every, you know, two hours for the first little bit. So, <laughs> all right. Um, so we have a, que a question about, I've been wanting to try ginger tea to help with nausea, but I'm finding a lot of brands just don't have ginger in them. Are there any other spices or flavorings that should be avoided like fennel, um, anise, chicory root, et cetera? So um, I, will, I will be the first to say, I don't always know every answer, um, but that said, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was doing a quick little lit search on a few of these and I saw that some of them do have potential toxic effects in pregnancy. Um, and so I, I would be careful and talk to your prenatal provider if you have a specific concern about something that you normally do take uh, for various symptoms. Um, there, there generally is some, some good information on that. I, I would say like if you're concerned about ginger, like whether you actually get the actual ginger into it, you can always do exactly what you're looking at, looking at the product labels and making sure that there actually are uh, ginger in the products that you're buying. Uh, you can always like make ginger tea with, um, with actual ginger plants and then go from there to maximize that. Okay. Um, and then Dr. Nelson, how about this? I do yoga and I've heard that you should not stand or do headstands if you have your heart over your head. Is that true? So you can't, you have the higher risk because of what we talked about with the dilation of your blood vessels during pregnancy, you can get lightheaded more easily, um, specifically with doing inversion type exercises or getting up too quickly. Uh, that being said, there's no specific contraindication to doing yoga headstands or something like that as long as you're not going to fall on your belly or as long as you're not feeling lightheaded. Okay. Uh, speaking of lightheadedness, we have a question about tips on dealing with lightheadedness when you're wearing a mask, um, like when you're walking around and doing a little more activity. Yeah, so that's a great question that pertains to all of us. I think we're all getting used to wearing masks a lot more often, whether we're pregnant or not. Uh, and so I think the, the most common reason that people feel lightheaded is usually because they're hyperventilating a little bit. They get nervous or anxious by having a mask on. And so they breathe a little bit more uh, quickly. So training yourself to kind of take slow, deep breaths. I personally, especially when I'm wearing an N95, which I have to do a lot of, which are harder to breathe through, I tend to leave my mouth open. Um, to really get a good, you know, uh, breath in. And other than that, you know, taking breaks when you really have to, if you need to go outside and move away from people and take your mask off and, and just breathe some deep breaths, that's fine too. But getting used to it is the biggest thing. Okay. Um, here's a question. Is it essential to stick to a particular diet if you have Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. Also, um, the recommendation regarding fish intake is they might contain inflammatory preservatives. How do we increase DHA during pregnancy? Couple different questions there. Well, the, regarding the, um, the hypothyroidism, you know, I would talk to your to talk to your prenatal or primary care doctor, because um, if you're already on some kind of thyroid supplement, there's a good chance you're actually gonna need more when you get pregnant. And um, you know, a lot of times people will start you on a, a slightly higher dose than what you had been on. And so that, that would be one of the biggest things rather than so much diet. Um, but I would talk to your primary doctor about that. And then also, um, you know, as far as DHA, um, the DHA is primarily from fish. Um, it's like the omega-3 fatty acids and it's primarily from, from fish supplies. And so in general, I'd recommend that. There's, there's a lot of different um, uh, of data about, about 
concerns for preservatives in general. If you um, get something that is is fresher than your, you know, that hasn't been um, like frozen, then you're a little bit more likely to to get something um, that, or if you're getting something that's not canned, uh, very unlikely to get preservatives in them. Um, and so, you know, I would probably get try to get fresh or maybe frozen rather than canned um, to avoid any preservatives. All right. Um, is it normal to have some anemia during pregnancy? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's normal, but at the same time, it's very common. And so, you know, I, I would say that we generally will start someone on iron supplementation uh, if their hemoglobin is less than 11. And we check that on the first prenatal visit and then throughout the pregnancy. And so we often see that iron uh, your body needs more and more iron as it, as it goes along to make more and more blood and to help keep you and baby doing well. And so it's very common, um, but we do want to make sure that if you do have anemia, that we are doing everything to make your body um, try to keep up with that by giving it enough iron to make those, those red cells. Okay. And we got kind of just a general um, uh, question. Um, this one says, I have a fibroid stock, no, fibroid on stock during pregnancy. What do you think the best thing is to eat and to do to avoid issues with that? Uh, that's a tough one. I, uh, I'm not sure that there's any particular activity or diet that would change the fibroid. That's okay. something that, that I'm sure that person's prenatal care provider is, is paying close attention to. Yeah. Okay. And then we got one that was submitted earlier. Um, is it okay to be sore after exercising or is it kind of bad to force your body to have to recover like that? Uh, good question. It's okay to be a little bit sore. Uh, All right. I think that that's the easiest answer. If you're, if you're pushing it consistently more and more, you, you might be a little bit sore if you're trying new things, if you're walking a little bit farther, um, just make sure that it's not getting to the point that it, you're incapacitated with the soreness okay. and okay. that you're maintaining hydration and, and nutrition. Oh. Sorry, another question came in. Do you suggest the in, intake of sweeteners or like sugar-free options? So like splendas and things like that? Yeah, and so there has been some research into that and actually the the overwhelming data, well, there's not, sorry, there's not been overwhelming data, but the, the limited data that we have is that um, it, it can cross the placenta and so to, to be wary of them. And so I wouldn't say, you know, if you have a big sweet tooth, I wouldn't say the solution is to just go to artificial sweeteners. Um, I would try to, you know, cut back as much as you can with um, those things and, and really try to avoid um, excessive sugar, um, whether it be actual sugar or artificial sweeteners. Okay. And we also had another question that came in. If a woman is working at a desk job and she's elevating your feet, is that a good solution? Um, is it recommended or are there are certain types of elevation um, that she can avoid? No, I think it's a good idea to elevate your feet if they're getting swollen. Uh, you can also buy compression stockings. They're becoming much more popular. You can find them a lot of places and they're much more stylish than they used to be, which can help with swelling. But also I, I would encourage everyone pregnant or non-pregnant to take frequent breaks if they're working at a desk job so that they can improve their circulation and, and kind of walk around a little bit. Okay. And are there any herbal teas you should avoid? I often drink sleep infusions. Another question that came in. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure about what sleep infusions is. Is that's like an over-the-counter product, or if it's something that you know you're making from various like herbal supplements? I would just be careful with a lot of these things um, are not FDA regulated, and so just be very cautious about that because they're they're they they usually have not been, unlike medications. You know, medications uh, they get pretty well studied and such, um, and a lot of people use them regularly, and and those those uh, groups are studied well. Um, a lot of these herbal supplements are are not as well studied, and so we're we're sort of going based on just a few experiences or, or some case reports. And so, you know, there, there are, if you Google probably almost any of these various um, herbal supplements, there's probably some case report where it's associated with a bad outcome, but 
unfortunately, even in those cases, we don't know for sure if, if they're really bad. There, there might be a few out there that, you know, are, are escaping me that, oh, you definitely don't want these, but, you know, just be, be careful about these herbal supplements and talk to your primary care doctor if you have, or, or um, your prenatal provider, if you have very specific concerns about like ones that you're doing. And I would try to hold off on them if you, if you are in an early part of pregnancy and you're unsure about it. Okay. Uh, another question that came in, what if you get muscle strain during exercise, especially in your abdomen, is that safe? So muscle strain is something that happens to many people and can usually be dealt with pretty easily with uh, ice or heat um, and rest, but it's always a good idea to check in if it's not going away quickly with your either primary care or prenatal care provider. And then in your abdomen specifically, I think this is why we're in the past, we've been very cautious with talking about doing abdominal exercises. I think it's, it's there are some modifications that can make it easier and less risky to do strengthening or maintain strength in the abdomen during pregnancy. Um, but just if you're, if you're continually doing something that's injuring your body, it may not be the right thing to do at this time. So check in with someone. Okay. Um, do you require, do you have different hydration needs during different trimesters? And is this connected to having less amniotic fluid? Uh, I, I usually don't counsel women on having different amounts throughout pregnancy. I would say it's really important to stay hydrated during pregnancy. And so, and, you know, if you are more active, then you definitely might need to drink more, um, you know, especially if you're, if you're sweating a lot or gaining a lot of sun exposure here in the state of Florida. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I would say probably you, you, I usually recommend like eight to 12 um, glasses of water a day um, if you're pregnant, but that, that doesn't change throughout pregnancy. Okay. And I, I like to talk about with both pregnant and non-pregnant patients that the amount of fluid that you need changes, like Dr. Tudin says, with your activity level, with the sun exposure, with how hot it is, um, and also with your pregnancy. So paying attention also to your urine color can be helpful too. So if it's really clear, you're probably doing a good job. If it's dark yellow, then uh, you might need a little bit more. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have for today. And uh, I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. Excellent, Excellent. presentation. And uh, I appreciate the time you took out of your day. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.